Thanks a lot, Ben, for the kind invitation. And thank you all for being here tonight. I was in Washington, D.C. on Monday and Tuesday. I'd say I much prefer being here to being in Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about a variety of topics tonight. But we're going to kick off by talking a bit about some of the finer points of the Farm Bill. What are some of the major provisions in the Farm Bill? What changed, what didn't change from last time around? We'll talk about the ARC ELC, uh, PLC election process in great detail if we can, and some big picture perspective if we have time at the end. But first and most importantly, why Ben Brown is here as opposed to being someplace else, like say the University of Missouri. So we do a test of our employees, see how good they are doing prognosticating. So we took a national survey to you know, have, have them checked. I have one employee scored in the top one percentile. I have made the top 10 percentile. And some other folks have been not just a bit below that. You see, Ben was in the 54th percentile. Now, we don't like just average folks in the University of Missouri. That, of course, was the ESPN tournament challenge for the basketball tournament I just completed here recently. All right, so what's, uh, what files are going to be based on my reading of the 2018 Farm Bill? I am not a lawyer, as Jonathan Kalpas will remind me. My wife will remind me on a constant basis. So I may have a few things wrong tonight. We're going to do the best we can, though. USDA has not yet uh, issued rules on a bunch of things. So we're going to have to see how those rules actually look at the end of the day. There may be some prices when those rules come out. Uh, the experience demonstrates that my reading of the bill will not always be exactly correct. So there's my disclaimer up front. So we've talked about some of the numbers already. I'm not going to go through every line on here, but kind of note the very bottom line of this chart. Net effect of the 2018 Farm Bill and the overall federal budget, according to the Congressional Budget Office, was zero. So if we took all the laws that were in place before in the 2014 bill, just extend them for 10 years in the future, with all sorts of other quirks about CBO scores things. They are saying this new bill will spend exactly the same amount of money to the nearest million dollars out of roughly a trillion total overall for the next 10 years. And even title by title is shown on the chart. Those changes are relatively small in the grand scheme of things, for the most part anyway. Those are fairly small percentage changes by title. For the most part, we kept money where it was. Okay. On the commodity program side, yes, there are some changes, but it's an evolutionary bill, not a revolutionary bill. If you like the 2014 bill, you probably like the 2018 bill. If you didn't like the 2014 bill, you probably won't like the 2018 bill either, because it hasn't changed that much. There are some changes on the commodity program side worth mentioning, though. We'll go through them one by one. First, farmers have the ability to update their, their PLC yields in some cases. That could prove important to a lot of people in lots of counties around the country, as we'll talk about. The formula uh, will allow reference prices to rise under some circumstances. If you have a high enough market price, the reference price could actually increase from current levels at least a little bit. The trend adjustment will be used in determining the benchmark for the agricultural risk coverage program. That's something new. Uh, there'll be multiple opportunities to make new ARC and PLC elections. Last time around, you had one choice for the five-year life of the bill. Now you have one choice in 2019 for the next couple of years, then new choices again in 2021, 2022, and in 2023. Higher loan rates for many crops, uh, changes in the payment limitation rules, and some restructuring of the dairy margin program, as has been alluded to. So again, looking at the CBO score, Here's all the various things that are in the, the Farm Bill for Title I for the commodity programs. If you look at the bottom line of this chart, you see that the overall change in farm program spending under Title I is, what, $263 million over the life of the Farm Bill. Now, that's, that's real money. I would take $263 million. I suspect you probably would, too. But compared to the overall value of Title I commodity programs, it's less than 1%. You know, so we're talking about changing overall spending on commodity programs by less than 1% here on net by CBO's reckoning. It's not a lot of new money, at least not, by the way. CBO looks to the world. Let's stop with that PLC payment yield. So the basic rule is that if your yield between 2013 and 2017 is sufficiently above what your program yield is, it's going to make sense for you to update your yield. It, the, the, the percentage by which you get to do it uh, relative to those yields depends on your actual, uh, the commodity you're growing and what the yields were between 2013 and 2017. I'm too tall. Yeah, you're He's just adding to the challenge here a little bit. After that basketball, Barbara. Right? All right. <laughs> so essentially, for the tw if, you're, if your corn yield multiplied between 2013 and 2017, multiply 0.81, 81%, is greater than your current PLC yield, it's going to make sense to update. This is not a complicated decision. Higher is better. You know, so it's not one that requires a lot of thought. You're going to figure out whether or not it's going to give you a higher yield to do this or not. You'll do accordingly. So where might this make sense? We've looked at county level data and our best guess as to which counties are most likely to have a positive result from, from increasing your, from going to your 2013 to 2017 yield. So where you may well have a chance to update your yields. 
So the counties in blue are the ones where that's most likely to occur. You see in Ohio, a north-south divide here, and some other states likewise, and very different uh, patterns in different parts of the country here. Now, just because your county is white does not mean you may not benefit from doing this. This is using county-level information. There may be farms within those counties that may still benefit from doing the update. So that's the corn situation. There's the same story for, for soybeans. Not quite as many counties for soybeans that are going to have the chance to benefit, probably. So again, that's one where you, once the rules are out, you're going to go to the office, they're going to tell you whether that's going to make sense for your farm to do or not, do what they tell you to do. Reference price adjustment formula. So the reference prices for most major commodities are kept at the current levels under most circumstances. With japonica rice, which I don't think is a big production item here in this county, this part of the world, uh, is one exception to the rule. So the reference price is the higher of the current reference price, so 370 for corn, 840 for soybeans, or 85% of the five-year moving average, Olympic average, throwing out the high, throwing out the low. Is that easy? Okay. So in other words, it can increase if the Olympic average price is more than 17% above the current reference price. Sounds simple, right? Well, it, it could happen. And, and so there will be circumstances where it does happen. While I was in D.C. on Monday and Tuesday, I was talking about a new stochastic baseline. We've done new projections for the farm economy for the next 10 years. When we solve our models 500 times, this happens occasionally, not very frequently. So we think the chance of a reference price increase is not very high, but it's also not zero going forward. ARC changes. Probably the single biggest change in ARC is that we'll have the ability to use trend-adjusted yields to calculate your benchmark revenue. So instead of just taking the last five years actual yields, throwing out the high, throwing out the low, we're going to trend adjust those historical yields just like we do for crop insurance. For people are able to take advantage of that in crop insurance. So this is going to add something to your, your, your ARC benchmark revenue. Exactly how much we're going to see how the rules come out, but probably in the order, you know, say five bushels or so an acre uh, for corn would be a typical bump up that's going to come uh, because of this provision. So that makes ARC a little bit more attractive. Likewise, if you have a very low yield, uh, instead of using the actual county yield, you can currently use 70% of that yield. So this will make that 80% of that yield. So again, uh, you, you're less likely to have a couple of low yields in the, your overall mix of calculating this benchmark revenue. So both those things will make ARC at least a little bit more attractive than it is today. We talked about the elections already. So again, you make one election in 2019, the exact dates of which have not been set yet. You know, sometime later this year, I heard September is one possibility. We'll see how long it takes the USD to get the rules out and get this implemented in the field. Then you can get revised those elections in, 19, in 2021, 2022, and again in 2023. So instead of one chance for five years, you have four chances for five years. So four chances to get it right or not to get it right, as the case may be. So we did a tool back in 2014. The crew at Illinois likewise did a tool that's out there. Uh, we're working with our colleagues at Texas A&M to once again have a tool available for people. It will be much simpler than last time because there's not as much, you know, not as many complicated decisions to make this time around. Uh, but we'll talk you through now what some of the, the trade-offs might be here. So first of all, remember that ARC is based on moving averages of things. So we take a five-year moving average of prices and a five-year average of yields, throwing out the high, throwing out the low. Does anybody know why it's called an Olympic average? Anybody old enough to know what that means? where that term came from. If you remember the Cold War era, if you're at the Olympics and you were, say, oh, a figure skater, for example, you would get a lousy score from the American judge and a good score from the Russian judge if you're Russian and vice versa if you were the other. So they decided to throw out the high, throw out the low, and average remaining judges to come up with your score. We're doing that for, uh, for various things in farm programs now. So for the first couple years of the, of the 2014 farm bill, we were averaging in a lot of those high prices we had between 2010 and 2013. So we had a 529 was the average price that went into the calculation for ARC for corn. Well, that's not the case anymore. Those high prices of 2010 to 13 are longer part of the mix. Now we're just averaging much lower prices. Uh, and so it's 370. In fact, given the way the rules were set up, it's going to be 370 for the next two years no matter what. No matter how high prices go the next year or how low they go the next year, it's going to be 370, period. It might increase in subsequent years or it might not. Soybeans, likewise, a very sharp drop-off in that benchmark uh, price that goes into the revenue calculations. So that alone means that you're less likely, all else equal, to get an ARC benefit in the future than you were during the first couple of years of the 2014 Farm Bill. Let's put that in numbers. So these are now national averages, which mean nothing whatsoever for you, you on your particular farm in your particular county. I know that. But on a national average basis, 
Yellow bar is what actual payments were between 2014 and 2017, and what our best guess is today for 2018. So the yellow is going to be ARC, the blue is going to be PLC. So on a national average basis, we have very large payments in 2014 for ARC. There were zero payments for PLC because the price was 370, exactly equal to 370. Reference price determines those payments. In 2015, we had a little bit below 370, so we have a small PLC payment for the few people who chose PLC. Again, another year of pretty large ARC payments in much of the country. 2016, 17, guess what? They're about the same. Any given point in the country, they'd be very different, but on average across the country as a whole, the average payment was about the same for folks who chose ARC and people who chose PLC. In 2017, for the first time, they reversed. So in 2017, the average PLC payment was much larger than the average ARC payment. We had a 336 season average price for corn. That's a 34 cent per bushel uh, PLC payment. ARC payments weren't very common because for most of the country, they had pretty good yields, you know, and, the, and those benchmark revenues have dropped as well. So again, much lower payments there in 2017. Our guess for 2018 is a similar pattern, but lower, uh, lower payments in for PLC if we have a price that's more than 336. The current guess is about 353 in our books for the current marketing year. So that's corn. Here's the same picture for soybeans. So we have yet to make a PLC payment for soybeans. And, and even though I'm showing a number there for 2018, that's because that's an average of 500 possible futures. And so there's a chance if, if markets crash the next couple, three months, we could have a low enough soybean price for the 2018 market year to actually generate a payment. The most likely outcome right now for the current market year is zero because we're looking at a probable price for soybeans around 855 or so. The reference price is 840. So therefore, we'd have no, no payment for PLC in the current market year either. There were very large ARC payments in, in some parts of the country, especially in 2015. But you note the overall levels here for soybeans are much lower than those for corn. Again, these are national averages. You know, if I talk about my home state of Missouri, 2014, there were basically no ARC payments at all because we had high yields in, 20, in Missouri in 2014. We had crappy yields in, in Missouri in 2015. We had big payments under ARC in that particular year. Wheat. So wheat's the one case I'll talk about in a second where people maybe not have done what they should not have done in retrospect. So here's the actual payment rates that have occurred so far for wheat. So in the first year, once again, we had a, a market price that was above the reference price. So in 2014, when people were signing up, PLC was going to pay zero, and people knew that. So not surprisingly, a lot of people did not sign up for PLC. But then it turned out in 2015, it was about a swap, about a you know even flip a coin sort of thing between the two programs. And then in 2016, we had the disastrous price here, a 389 season average price for the country as a whole, compared to 550 reference price, gave you a very very large PLC payment if you're in that program. Whereas the ARC payments are capped at 10% of the value of the benchmark. So the average ARC payment is much, much smaller than that. See the numbers for 2017-18, and again, our projections for the current 2018-19 marketing year. So again, why this might look less attractive, why ARC may look less attractive in the future than it did last time around. Some of we've seen already what's occurred the last couple of years. So what I've done here is I've, I've got two lines. The, the, uh, the, the blue line is going to be uh, the, the benchmark price, if you will, that goes into the calculations. So I'm going to take the moving average of prices, the five-year average, throwing out the high, throwing out the low, multiplying that by 0.86, because that's the magic percentage uh, for ARC. And so if you have an average yield in this particular year, a yield that's equal to your, your benchmark yield, then you would get a payment if and only if the blue line is above the red line. If the red line is above the blue line, you don't get no payment, okay? So the first three years on average across the country, payments remain in ARC, we saw that before. In 2017, it was kind of flip a coin. And in 2018, no payments occur. Okay? 2019, 2020, 2021, 22, 23, under average conditions, and I stress under average conditions, average prices, average yields, there would now be ARC payments for the next five years. We won't have average prices, we won't have average yields, there will be payments almost for in some year. But it's not like it was in 2014 where we were pretty confident the first couple of years we were going to get big ARC payments. That's not the case this time around. That's corn. So again, just making that case that, you know, that, uh, again, we, we've had those, that switch occur uh, between uh, the comparison of those things uh, before and after that period of time. Then throw in the 370 reference price, just to, for a point of comparison. So you can see that in the first couple of years of the Farm Bill, yeah, essentially the price guarantee from ARC was higher than the price guarantee from, from, from PLC if you had average yields. That's not true going forward. Now, mind you, going forward, look at where our prices happen to sit 
compared to the PLC reference price. We're just ever so slightly above the PLC reference price on our average price projection for the future. So if our average prices were to happen every single year for the next five years, and you had average yields every year, how much would you get in our, our PLC payments no matter which one you picked? Zero. So it takes an unusually low price or an unusually low yield to generate payments under either program. Okay? A normal yield will not, will not generate payments, given where we're sitting today, given our law for the future at least. Okay? Just talked about that. Here's the same picture for soybeans. So the same basic story again, the, the first couple years you had a likely payment occurring as long as your yields weren't abnormally high under ARC, whereas that's not true anymore. So going forward again, given at least given our price projections right now, the chance of an ARC payment is not very high in the future unless you have bad yields. And there's a reference price for soybeans. Again, it's a tougher call. You, you're not gonna have big payments for no matter what you do uh, for soybeans unless we have an unusual year, it appears to us. Because we're nerds, we like to show off sometimes. You know, so we solve our models 500 times for different combinations of weather, demand factors, other things that could drive the market. And I won't pretend for a second we've captured every, all the uncertainty out there. All 500 outcomes here, for example, assume that we have current trade relationships continuing. That will probably not prove to be true. There's probably other assumptions we make that probably will prove not to be true. But given the uncertainties we take into account, there's 500 possible outcomes for prices going this way and for yields going that way for the next, uh, for the 2019 crop, the crop we're going to harvest this fall. So if you take an average of all those outcomes, you get our, you know, the, what we published in our book this week, a 381 price and 174 bushel yield. So if we have an average year, that's what we're looking at. But note that, that you know, that's not what always happens. You can be well above, well below that on prices, be above that or below on yields, obviously. All else equal, low yields cause high prices and vice versa. But you can have other factors like demand shifts that can cause that not to be true in every single case. It's not just a line, it's a dispersion around that line. So think about what that implies now. So if you have a 370 reference price in 47% of our 500 outcomes for the 2019 marketing year, we would have a PLC payment occurring. So even though our average price is just a little bit above that 370 reference price, there's almost a 50-50 chance of the price being below the, uh, the reference price and therefore generating a PLC payment. So implications. So for corn and soybean producers, ARC was very attractive in 2014, as I said. For 2019, the comparisons may be very different. If actual county yields are equal to the trend-adjusted Olympic average yield, the marking your average price for corn has to be less than 318 a bushel to generate an ARC payment. So I say it again. So if you have an average yield year, you would only get an ARC payment in 2019 if, you're, if the price is below 318 a bushel, okay? Whereas any price below 370 would generate a PLC payment. So we expect higher participation in the 2019 Farm Bill than our 2014. This is not to say there will not be producers for whom ARC will be the appropriate choice. I'm not saying that at all. It depends on your local circumstances, what your local yields are, for example. Back in 2014, it made very, very good sense for most corn producers around the country to sign up for ARC. That was the right choice. It proved to be ex, ex post the right choice. For some producers in Missouri, it was not the right choice. Why? Because we had abnormally low yields in the previous five years. So our benchmarks are very low. And so if we were to have normal yields as we did in the subsequent years, we wouldn't get many ARC payments, whereas PLC might pay off. And indeed, we had higher participation in PLC in Missouri than in most other states. It made sense, given our circumstances. That sort of thing could happen again here across the country this next time. So 2014-18 payment rates, uh, you know, this is what actually occurred uh, compared to what, what we projected back in 2015. So in 2015, uh, when people were signing up for the program, we projected an average payment rate for corn of $27 an acre and an average PLC payment rate of $20 an acre over the life of that farm bill. See the numbers there for soybeans and for, uh, uh, for wheat, for our projections back in 2015. And then what's actually occurred, at least what we think has occurred uh, based on the first four years we know for sure, 2018, we're still, we don't know for sure, we're guessing on 2018 yet, but we think we have a ballpark guess on that. We are not that good. I want to make that clear. You know, we happen to be with $1 an acre, it looks like right now, as to what the average corn payment turned out to be for ARC, within $3 an acre for, uh, for PLC. I will not for a second pretend that was all skill. That was mostly luck. It's sort of like my basketball picks, you know? Luck is more important than, than skill sometimes. 
But nevertheless, we were saying back then that yes, ARC had an advantage. It wasn't quite as big of an advantage as some people tried to say it was, but it wasn't either the right choice for most corn producers. Likewise, for soybean producers, you know, the, most people were saying at the time, we were saying at the time, ARC was probably going to be the better choice for most soybean producers. It turned out at the end of the day the payments were low under both programs, both ARC and PLC, than we anticipated for soybeans. We didn't really have any really awful year on prices or on revenues for soybeans, so we never had a really big payment year for soybeans over the course of the 2018 Farm Bill. And then wheat, of course, is the one exception to the rule here. So for the most part, producers around the country on average picked the right program, the program that generated the most payments for them over the life of the bill. Wheat was the exception. So wheat, we actually have more base enrolled in uh, the uh, uh, ARC program of the 2014 bill, when in retrospect, the PLC program was, was proved to be the one that paid out more on average uh, for most people around the country. We had predicted that at the time. And uh, again, that's one where we, you know, we probably we wish people had been, been willing to look at the numbers, maybe a bit more closer than some did at the time. Okay. So uh, uh, what's, what do we expect then for the future? So participation rates. So again, I don't know what participation rates are going to be, nor does anybody else. But given the fact that we are likely to see this shift in average payment rates, we expect that more folks are going to find PLC attractive next time around than the last time around. It won't be 100%. And I'm sure whatever we put here is not going to be the right number either. You know, we're basing this primarily on this, these estimates of what future payments are going to be. There will be other considerations at play. As Keith told you, it depends in part on what sort of risk you can handle on your farm. You know, what do you care more about? What what's causes you grief? What keeps you up at night? Should be part of the calculation as well. But if one program pays twice as much as the other program, I know what I'm going to do. You know, so those considerations are, have to be kept in, in, uh, in perspective. So here's our average payment rates uh, um, uh, for, for ARC and PLC between 2014 and 18 by crop. So we talked about corn and soybeans already and wheat a little bit already. Sorghum PLC was on average the one that paid more. Barley was about a flip of the coin. Um, for 19 to 23, of course, now we reverse the picture. So again, higher average payment rates for PLC given our current projections for all the commodities here, although soybeans is much closer than any of the other ones. And then throwing it for kicks uh, for, for sake of, our, of comparison here. Kept corn on the chart so you can see how you know, corn was, you know, here's corn before. Here's corn now when I put in uh, peanuts and, and rice as my comparison point. Very large payments for those two commodities under PLC. Okay. So participation rates by crop we talked about already. So higher participation rates for PLC we would expect right now. But again, you're going to make the choices on that. You'll have a chance to prove us wrong. And our picture for the future on overall spending looks very similar to CBOs. So like CBO, we project a very large increase in PLC spending in front of us, averaging something like $5 billion a year over the next decade, which by coincidence happens to be almost identical to what direct payments were under the previous farm bill, the 2008 farm bill. So it doesn't, didn't have to work out the way, but happened to work out that way. Whereas our payments get to be pretty small if our projections uh, bear out. Just to remind ourselves how complicated these things can be, here's one county in Missouri. It's a county just northeast of Columbia, Audrain County. So how those calculations work for the current marketing year. So again, we take the, the last five years prices, we replace any price below 370 with that 370 reference price. We throw out the high price, the 2013 price of uh, 446. We throw out one of the 370s. So 370, 370, 370, that's an average of 370. Okay, that's simple, right? The average yield you see for the county uh, was 158 bushels an acre when you throw out the high and throw out the low. You multiply those two things together, that's 583. You take 86% of that, that's 502. And so for the crop we harvested last fall, a payment's going to occur in that county if and only if taking the national average price multiplied by the Audrain County yield happens to be less than $502 an acre. Is that likely to happen? Well, we had terrible yields in that particular county. We had flooding. And other, or we had drought, we had drought sorry, last summer, flooding this year, drought last year, uh, that severely reduced yields in that county. So the NAS estimate for the yield in that county was actually 131 bushels an acre uh, for 2018. So as long as the price is less than 383 for the current marketing year, which it's going to be, we're going to get an ARC payment in that particular county this year. If, on the other hand, we'd had an average year with a yield of 158 bushels per acre, the same as what the five year average was. Then there have been no payments unless the price was less than 318 a bushel. So again, just how even in a year like this where not many ARC payments have been made nationwide, it can indeed occur if you have a bad 
you know, bad yield here, whereas PLC depends only on the national average price. So things to note, the right choice will differ by crop, by county, and by producer. So the relationship between expected ARC and PLC payments differs across crops. PLC may seem an obvious choice for many crops, uh, while it's a closer call for others. Soybeans is one where it's a closer call. County yield history matters a lot. ARC will be more likely to pay in some counties than others. If you've had a really good yield history in your county, that's going to make your ARC benchmarks very high. If you think that's an abnormally high yield we've had the last five years, you know, then that makes ARC more attractive, although it's equal and vice versa. Uh, PLC program yields. Now, the farm specific factors can make, mean different farms within a county can have different optimal choices. And then finally, what type of risk is of greater concern? Longer term depressed prices, if that's your worry, that's what keeps you up at night. PLC is the program for you. If on the other hand, a short term drop in revenues that could be caused by either prices or yields, that makes ARC more attractive, all else equal. Loan rates. So we've increased loan rates for uh, most major commodities, at least somewhat in the case of corn and soybeans. We go from buck 95 to $2.20 a bushel for the national average loan rate for corn. We go from $5 a bushel to $6.20 per bushel as the national average loan rate for soybeans. Each county has its own loan rate. That can be a bit different than that. So that's an increase that, of course, doesn't necessarily mean we're going to have any payments under that program. We would like to hope we don't have corn prices below $2.20 a bushel. We'd like to hope we don't have soybean prices below $6 a bushel. But nevertheless, it does give you some marketing opportunities where you can you know, place a crop under loan at the harvest time get more cash in your pocket for doing so than you could have under the previous bill. Other Title I provisions, uh, changes in the payment limitation rules. Nieces, nephews, and first cousins are more likely, more likely to qualify as, a, as a active participants than was in the case in the past. I am not a lawyer. If you have questions, ask Jonathan about anything there. Seed cotton provisions are a big deal for all of you here, I'm sure, right? Okay, we won't talk about that. Uh, Newark or PLC payments of no crop planted on base acres in the last 10 years. So if you have a farm and you have not planted anything for the last 10 years on that farm, and it's only been in grass for the last 10 years, you no longer can receive ARC or PLC payments for the next for life of this farm bill, at least. You don't lose the base, but for the life of the farm bill, you cannot receive payments for ARC or PLC. You can instead receive a CSP payment of $18 per acre. Okay, now let's think about the politics. You know, we talked a lot about politics in the previous two presentations. Anybody know where the chairman of the Senate Ag Committee is from? Great state of Kansas, right? Kansas. How's an $18 an acre payment rate sound for somebody in western Kansas? That may not be too bad. Let's say you're a rice producer in Mississippi, to pick on somebody else in the audience here. That may not be a very good payment. So there's probably some folks in some parts of the country not very happy about this provision, some other parts of the country where it's not such a big deal. Here I suspect you don't have that many acres affected. Dairy, just real briefly. Um, now again, we've got a pretty major change. This is a far bigger change on dairy that would be the case on the crop side. Uh, we are, we've significantly changed the level of, of coverage that's available and the cost of that coverage for the first five million pounds of production on a farm. So previously you could not get coverage levels as high. Now you get a coverage level as high as $9.50 per hundredweight. So a difference between the milk price and the feed price if it's less than $9.50 per hundredweight, you can get a payment if you've chosen to buy the higher level of coverage. The cost of that coverage is only 15 cents a hundredweight. Uh, that's amazingly cheap, to be honest. I mean, that is not an actuarial cost of that level of coverage. That level of coverage is not available for production above 5 million pounds on a farm. In fact, the highest level available for, the, for a, a large farmer or for those last production above 5 million is $8 per hundredweight, and that costs very, very much to do so. So we don't expect many folks with, with very large operations to ensure beyond the 5 million pound uh, level. Is that going to pay out or isn't it? Well, of course, we don't know. But you see the top line there is the 950. So if you bought the highest level of coverage available, the middle line in red there is going to be our projected average margin for the next several years. You know that every single year our average margin is less than 950 maximum that, that you can buy. So that means every single year if those projections were to be borne out, you would be able to get a benefit from this program. And in fact, the benefit would be greater than the cost of the premium you'd have to pay. So it looks to us like that for many, many small producers, this program will indeed provide them some benefit. Is it enough to keep every small producer in business? It is not. I have four cousins who are still dairy farming, uh, two of them operating my grandparents' farms on either side of the family. And I'm not confident of their ability to survive, frankly, given how tough these times are right now. This will provide at least some benefit to the small scale producer. So kind of putting all the pieces together, and I'll wrap up here before too long. 
uh, I looked at what happens if you just uh, compare farm bills, if you will. So in each set of the following slides, the first bar is going to be what actually occurred between 2008 and 2013, so the life of the 2008 farm bill, the farm bill before we put these new programs in place. The second set of bars is going to be 2014 to 17. That's actual data that's been collected by FSA. Those should be good numbers, in other words. 2018 is our own projection. It may not be exactly right, but it should be in the ballpark. The next one's going to be 2019 to 2023, the life of the new farm bill based on CBO's estimates. And then right next to that, our estimates for the same thing. So first is going to be Title I, you know, the commodity programs that was my charge to talk about tonight. So between 28, 2008 and 2013, we spent about $5 billion a year on direct payments and next to nothing on anything else. You know, we had Acre, but hardly anybody participated, never paid out the life of that farm bill. Um, market loans were irrelevant during those years of high prices. So again, direct payments were almost the entire set of Title I payments under that farm bill. Between 2014 and 2017, we had the years of very large ARC payments. So the blue part of the bar there is very large. And it turns out that the sum of ARC and PLC during the life of the, those first four years of the Farm Bill was actually greater than we had spent on direct payments on the previous Farm Bill, suggesting that that shift was actually a good one to have made. We wouldn't have had that kind of level payments probably unless Acre had paid out a bunch. In 2018, of course, much lower payments, for the reasons we talked about on the ARC side. Uh, 2019 to 23, both CBO and we say about $5 billion a year on payments on average. It could be near zero some years. It could be very, very large some years. But an average of $5 billion on PLC. We're saying a little bit different numbers on ARC. We have actually a little bit more than CBO does on the ARC side, but not much either there. And then we actually have some possibility some marking loan benefits once in a while. Not so much for corn and soybeans, but primarily for cotton and for some other crops uh, now grown in this part of the country. Okay, same chart. All I've done now is add to that chart the average net indemnities to farmers for crop insurance benefits. So not the total cost of the crop insurance program, but just the part that goes to farmers directly. What farmers pay, or I mean, what farmers get back in indemnity payments minus what the farmers paid in premiums. So once I add that to the mix, you know, the, the comparison of, of the 2008 and 2014 farm bills looks different, right? So instead of the 2014 farm bill being more expensive as it was focusing only on Title I, once I add in crop insurance, the 2014 farm bill was actually lower cost, or lower benefits at least to farmers, than was the case under the 2008 farm bill. Why? Because we had really large crop insurance payments in 2012 in particular, but didn't have any sniffing of payments uh, since the, the 2014 farm bill went into place. See again our estimates there for 2018 and for 2019 through, through 23, both CBO and ours. Again, we're telling similar stories there, just a little bit slightly different levels. Then let's throw an MFP. So through on that eight to nine billion dollars of MFP payments have been paid out uh, for, for uh, trade assistance this past year. So now instead of 2008 being the low year, 2008 is now the high year of these comparisons when we throw that in the mix, 2018 I should say. And then finally throw in the conservation payments. This is our guess about what the conservation payments of farmers would be on a calendar year basis, taking CBO's estimates for the future and doing some allocation, how much that results in actual payments to producers. So again, when you look at the final uh, set of bars there, either CBOs or ours, it turns out that we've got roughly five to six billion dollars a year of ARC and PLC, Title I benefits, roughly five or six billion dollars per year of crop insurance, net indemnities, and roughly five billion dollars per year of, of uh, conservation benefits to farmers. So guess what, you know, three titles doing roughly the same level of support to farm, the farm sector going forward, on average. So things to note, Again, ARC and PLC under 2014 were similar to direct payments under 2008. String of above average yields have kept crop insurance costs very low during the life of the 2014 Farm Bill. We assume more average weather, more variability in front of us. That, that's why it's not because of any change in policy, it's just because of assumed differences in weather in front of us. That 2018 uh, bill uh, crop insurance goes up a bit. See the MFP numbers and the comparison there between us. So my fast final couple slides here, you know, some big picture stuff for the sector as a whole. Left hand chart is overall direct government payments. So it'll be ARC, PLC, dairy payments, conservation reserve payments, other direct payments farmers get from the government. With the highest year being 2018 because of those very large MFP payments. They remain large in 2019 calendar year because not only because of ARC and PLC that might be made, but primarily frankly because a lot of the MFP payments were made after the 1st of January. So some of the MFP shows up in 18, some of it shows up in 19. The right hand side is net farm income estimates. So you can see the, uh, the sharp drop from the peak 
over $120 billion in FRM income for the country as a whole in 2013, down to you know, the low 60s in both 2016 and 2018. 2019, yes, is a little bit better, but not much in our projections and in USDA's projections. Uh, and the improvement in subsequent years is also very modest. It doesn't keep going down, thank goodness. Once you correct for inflation, and we get to a certain level about 2020 or so, and we remain there for the life of our 10-year basin, if I showed you more of the future, depends on this chart. Farm real estate values, uh, the yellow bars are going to be Ohio national, or Ohio average uh, real estate values, according to NAS, the National Ag Statistics Service. Orange is going to be the national average. We aren't doing projections for Ohio yet, although we could talk to Ben about maybe doing that in the future. Uh, but for uh, the country as a whole, relatively flat real estate values in front of us is what we're currently projecting. Given, you know, study to only slightly increasing FRM income, higher interest rates than we've had, the incentives we've had to increase land values aren't there anymore. So instead of a 50% increase that we actually experienced between 2009 and 2018, I think our, interest, our increase between 2018 and 2028, if I extend this chart out farther, is a whopping 2%. You know, so a very different story in front of us than we've seen. Rental rates, likewise, relatively flat on average. Obviously, different parts of the country with very different experience, both historically and in the future. So it's not the 1980s, but. So this one's giving you a longer sweep of history. Not quite as, as long as uh, some of Jonathan's longer sweeps of history, but going back to the 80s. This uh, debt asset ratio is a good indicator of the overall financial. It's not a perfect indicator by any means. It's an overall indicator. Don't worry so much about the levels, but worry about the changes. So in 1985, at the height of the farm crisis, the national average ratio of all the farmers' debts divided by all the farmers' assets was 22.2%. Uh, That's the highest it had been in recorded history. That's of people who had debt. Of course, a lot of folks didn't have any debt. Those who didn't have debt, take those out of the mix. Those who had debt, be a much higher percentage than that. That average dropped by half between 1985 and 2012. We were down to 11.3%, uh, I believe it was, in 2012. Since 2012, it's been creeping up. 13.5% in 2018, USDA says. And our projections, it gets to about 15% about by the time we get to year 2028. So it's not the 80s, it's not the 80s, but it's not the right direction. So this is the current, you know, keeping the world looking like it does today future. I think the job of all of us in the room is figure out a way not to let this happen. You know, what can we do to make this not be the outcome at the end of the day? We hope these projections sometimes are self-defeating and we'll make changes that will avoid them from happening in front of us. So thanks very much. I wanted to tell Ben I was going to use this picture one last time. This is a group shot of our, of our photo from maybe not this year, maybe not last year, maybe more than a couple years ago at this point. Uh, but it's been great having, having a chance to be here tonight. And again, thanks to you all for, for being here, and thanks to Ben for the invitation. Thanks.